I remember on this shoulder, a hand touched me like right here, and they told me everything was going to be okay. It's actually really weird, but ever since then, I'll be walking outside and a butterfly will come and land on me. <laughs> They're just, it's amazing. I mean, she's, she's got a whole new open spirit about her. There was somebody watching over us, yeah. You put a butterfly on the tree? I'll put butterflies everywhere. <laughs> That's what it takes. May 22nd, 2011, started like any other day in Joplin, a town in southwest Missouri with a population of about 50,000. That Sunday saw Joplin citizens going about their normal routines, attending church, running errands, and some attending the graduation ceremony for Joplin High School's class of 2011. But there had been some indication that skies would not be clear that evening. Meteorologists were keeping an eye on a supercell thunderstorm developing in the state of Kansas and traveling towards the Missouri border. At one point, there were five or six storms all capable of producing tornadoes, said meteorologist Ron Hurst. Two thunderstorms eventually merged just west of Joplin and began producing the megatornado. This tornado was first reported outside of Joplin sometime around 5 p.m., prompting sirens to be sounded throughout the area. At 5.17, the National Weather Service issued a tornado warning for the town of Joplin, ordering residents to immediately take shelter. This warning gave citizens about 17 minutes to prepare before the tornado touched ground outside of Joplin. There is the tornado. For about half an hour, the tornado ravaged the town of Joplin, gradually growing in strength from an EF2 to a mile-wide EF-5 tornado, with wind speeds exceeding 200 miles per hour. The National Weather Service announced the storm had dissipated by 6.12 p.m., but in its wake, the tornado left 161 dead and over 1,000 injured. It was so dark when night fell, said reporter Ashley Reynolds. All night we heard loud sirens, search dogs barking and people screaming while they combed through the rubble in hopes of finding their loved ones. People were walking around in shock. The nightmare was real. The Joplin tornado is now believed to have been the costliest in American history, with damages estimated at well over $3 billion. The days following May 22nd were full of heartbreak for the community, as many mourned loved ones and searched for survivors in the rubble of collapsed businesses and homes. Yet amidst the grief and trauma so many Joplin citizens were going through, they were emerged an enduring symbol of hope for the town, in the form of a butterfly. 14-year-old Emily Huddleston was being driven home from her brother's graduation ceremony when their car was picked up by the tornado and thrown nearly two blocks. A piece of debris flew into the car and lodged in her leg, but she was the only one of her group seriously injured. Emily was treated at a nearby hospital and cared for until she was finally able to walk on her own again although she would still have a long road of healing ahead of her. As summer progressed and the family began to rebuild their lost home, Emily began to notice something odd. Every time she went outside, butterflies would land on her. There will be some that I can't get to leave me alone, she said, sharing a picture of a monarch that landed on her arm. She said at the time that she felt they didn't have much significance, but when she heard stories of butterfly people witnessed by other survivors, she viewed these encounters in a whole new light. I look at them as my angels, she said. I really do. Stories of the butterfly people, as they were dubbed by the children who were said to have seen them, rapidly spread through the community during rescue and cleanup efforts. These stories were most often secondhand, heard from a friend of a friend, tales of otherworldly, winged creatures protecting and comforting survivors during and in the immediate aftermath of the deadly tornado. We'll be examining several of these stories today, beginning with one of the only first-hand accounts of angelic creatures ministering to the people of Joplin. On the evening of May 22nd, cousins Lage Grigsby and Mason Lillard, aged 14 and 10 respectively, joined their grandparents, Sharon and Rodney, on a trip to their local Home Depot. 
While Rodney went into the store to pick up some electrical supplies, Sharon waited in the car with her two grandchildren, watching as dark clouds began to roll into the sky. Lage's aunt had heard about the developing tornado and rushed to call Sharon, telling her to get the kids to safety as soon as possible. However, there wasn't enough time for the group to reconvene or take shelter. With Rodney still inside the store, Sharon told Mason to climb onto the floorboard of the truck while Lage remained in his seat. We've got to pray, Sharon recalls telling her grandchildren. Their truck was thrown 300 feet across the parking lot, and upon impact, Sharon and Mason were trapped inside, and Lage had been thrown from the vehicle. At the same time, the roof was ripped off the Home Depot, and its walls began to fall. Yet miraculously, Rodney survived the collapse and was able to climb out of the rubble and begin searching for his wife and grandchildren. According to an article written by the Joplin Globe, Rodney was only able to find the car amid the remains of the store after seeing its license plate, which read, Number One Grandpa. When the fire department arrived at the scene, officials discovered that Mason had been impaled by a metal rod that had entered through the roof of the car into her shoulder. It took about 45 minutes to extract Mason from the car, and the surgeons that worked to remove the rod from her body said she would likely not have made it to the hospital if it had moved even an inch in either direction. Meanwhile, Lage was found amid the debris and brought to the hospital by emergency officials. Likely because someone thought he was already deceased, he was left in the morgue. ER nurse Tracy Dye was coming into work around this time, and as she was walking through the morgue, she placed a hand on Lage's arm, and in her words, he let out a scream. I ran and got a doctor and we got him out of there. Lage was then rushed into a six-hour surgery that saved his life. To this day, Lage and his family call Tracy their angel. In Mason's recovery from the accident, she started telling the story of what she experienced moments before the car was picked up by the tornado. She said that as the winds grew stronger and they began to pray, she felt a hand placed on her shoulder. I thought it was Lage, she said, but when I turned, I saw two angels in robes, one with brown hair and one with blonde hair. It was kind of calming. I knew God was with us and that he'd take us to be with him or leave us to do something great. While Mason was adamant about the otherworldly figures she saw in the car that day, 14-year-old Lage said he recalled no such thing. Probably the most well-known story on this subject is one whose origins are unclear. We do not know the identity of the child who is said to have witnessed it, and because the story spread through the town by word of mouth, it is impossible to know how the story has changed and evolved over time. Retellings often have discrepancies when it comes to small details, but the tale tends to stay consistent with its bigger picture. The story goes that a mother and her four-year-old daughter were driving through Joplin as the tornado began to close in on them. For an unknown reason, the mother decided that they could not stay in the car, and so she grabbed her daughter and ran away, possibly trying to take shelter in a nearby building. The mother then looked over her shoulder, only to see their own car flying through the air, headed straight towards them. The two hit the ground, the mother shielding her daughter with her own body, both frozen in fear and dread. Yet the collision never happens. The winds die down, the storm moves on, and the mother and daughter stand up, both completely unharmed. Weren't they pretty? The daughter asks. The mother does not know what she means and asks her to explain, but she asks her mother another question. Didn't you see the butterfly people? In the lens of this story, the four-year-old claims to have seen creatures she viewed as butterfly people protecting them in the storm. Another version of the story is that the girl saw this butterfly person use its wings to protect them from flying debris. However, there seems to be no consensus of what exactly the young girl saw, and no clue as to the identity of the mother and daughter who were said to have experienced this divine intervention. The second story of unknown origin to be passed around Joplin was one of a grandfather and his two grandchildren, boys said to be anywhere from three to five years old, depending on who was telling it. It was said the three had been trapped outside of a building as the tornado approached, 
So they laid on the ground and held onto the grass to keep from being picked up by the wind. The wind was so strong that it was said to have ripped the soles of their shoes off. However, like the story of the mother and daughter, the storm quickly moved on from them, leaving the three miraculously uninjured. In its aftermath, the kids started talking about butterfly people flying overhead, creatures they said had protected them during the storm. There is no shortage of stories of the butterfly people in Joplin, often very similar to the three we just heard. On a town plaque in Joplin, other supposed encounters are summarized, one of which reads as follows. A young girl was lifted into the air by the storm, but a butterfly quickly wrapped its wings around her and brought her safely to the ground. Another says, without a scratch, a child in a car seat emerged from a car filled with glass and debris. When safe from the wreckage, the child described a butterfly wrapping its wings around him, protecting and making him feel safe. School counselor Shelby Wilson, who volunteered for the Red Cross in Joplin, said she heard several stories of the butterfly people when talking to survivors, although never from anyone who actually witnessed them firsthand. It's the only way we can really, honestly understand how more people were not killed, she said. When you walk through what was left, it just kind of took your breath away. Some believed that the butterfly people described by children were actually guardian angels that physically intervened in our world, but others believed it was likely the children's way of coping with such a traumatic event. In a previous video, we discussed the third man phenomenon, in which a person experiencing something traumatic reports another presence accompanying them, seen or unseen, which comforts and protects them. The third man, as it is called, is thought by many to be a hallucination brought on by periods of extreme stress. With Joplin being a deeply religious town, many children were likely used to hearing stories of benevolent angels in Sunday school, so it wouldn't be impossible to imagine that the comforting image of an angel would be present in their subconscious. But it seems we will never know for sure if first-hand encounters, such as Mason's, were divine or completely natural. And as for second-hand stories of the mother and daughter, and the grandfather and his two boys, we cannot be sure that they happened as told, if at all, unless the original witnesses come forward. But whether or not butterfly people actually visited the town of Joplin, these stories have taken on a life of their own and provided comfort to a hurting and healing community. Just as butterflies, still a relevant symbol for the town, are formed in darkness, the town of Joplin has emerged from this tragedy stronger than it was before. Thank you for watching this video, and of course, I would love to hear your thoughts on this subject. If you have any other stories you would like me to cover in the future, please feel free to leave those in the comments below. And as always, stay safe.